What's good, everybody? Welcome to the John Katz Show. I hope everybody's having an amazing day. I'm um, your host, John Katz, and I am joined by an extraordinarily special guest today, Mr. Lilo Brancato Jr. Thanks, John. Thank you for having me, but I appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on, man. The pleasure is all mine. How are you doing today? I'm all right. I'm all right. Thank God. And yourself? Good. Doing well. Thank you so much. Did I say it right, by the way? Is it, It's Lilo, not Lilo, right? Yeah, no, you said it right. Okay. I was surprised because a lot of people say Lilo, Lilo. Right. <laughs> it's Lilo. I want to make sure I say it how you say it. So. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Uh, you guys, I'm sure a lot of you know uh, Lilo from his work. He's been in some uh, iconic film and uh, television, uh, Bronx Tale from 1993. Uh, he was in uh, some other Crimson Tide uh, he was in Renaissance Man, a little show you guys might know called The Sopranos, season two. Uh, so we're going to get to all that. And he also has a very, very interesting, unique life and story uh, dealing with uh, addiction and incarceration and all of the stuff that he's doing now um, in, in such a positive and motivational way. So there's a lot to talk about. And I do need to apologize to you guys because... I was just telling him before the show too. Bronx Tales may be my favorite movie, and Sopranos may be my favorite show. So if I giggle like a little schoolgirl during the interview, I apologize. <laughs> but um, if we can start out, you know, for people that don't know your story and where you started out and and how you got into acting and all that, you're from Yonkers, right? Yonkers, New York. Yeah, it's, it's right near the Bronx, uh, like maybe 25 minutes north of New York City. <laughs> um, as far as my story. I mean, I was old, I was adopted when I was a baby, four months uh, from Bogota, Colombia. I was adopted into an Italian family, not Italian American. They were Italian. My father was from Sicily, an immigrant who came and built homes, was a mason, a bricklayer, and then my mom was a homemaker. She was Calabrese, and uh, you know, they met <clears throat> in Yonkers. There was a section of Yonkers where all of the Italian. Amer you know, the Italians migrated to was a section in South Yonkers. Park Hill, that's where they met. Had a miscarriage, didn't think they could have any more children, tried many times, then decided we're going to adopt. Found me in an orphanage in, in South America. Amazing. Uh, wanted me, everything went through. Then my mom found out she was pregnant with my brother Vincent, who's nine months younger than me. Oh. May 12, 1977, I'm August 30th, 1976. So... Uh, <clears throat> grew up in Yonkers, New York, middle class. We always had a good life. My father's a good man, hardworking guy, gave us everything. My mom, you know, great cooks. I mean, you know, great, uh, great, great upbringing. Then when I was 15, going to be 16 in the summer of 1992, I start here. It was even more started in, starting in the spring, right. uh, in spring. I would hear people talk about, oh, yo, Robert De Niro is doing this movie called The Bronx Tale. They're looking for kids. You know Sal? Yeah, he went to read for the part. You know Jerry? I heard he got a part of the movie because they're using his aunt Storm in the movie. Right. So this is all the stuff you hear, you know? Right. So, <clears throat> And you'd never acted before that, right? You'd never no. thought about... No, the, never thought about it, nothing. It was just, Not you know, even an ass weird ass. You were just a regular I mean, team. I was a big Robert De Niro fan because right. people told me that I looked like him. Right. So... After that, I like watched his movies a little close, a little closer, and you know, try to like you know, then you know, impersonate him and do things like that. But you're but, a regular teen at this point in the Bronx, just or in Yonkers, excuse me, just hanging out. By the way, settle the Yonkers debate is it city or is it Hudson Valley? It's like they both try to claim it. I know it's Westchester County. Kind of, who gets the it's claim? A city. It's a city it's in a city, Westchester right? County, yeah. It's on the Hudson Valley because the Hudson River's here, right? Right. People Let's think of it as New York Yonkers, City. Down South Yonkers by the train and all that. And right. uh, the Hudson River's right there. And the city's right there. But So you're 15, 16. You hear De Niro's making a movie. <clears throat> yeah. So like when you hear like all of this, oh, he went to read this guy, this guy. It's, kind, it's not really encouraging. It's more discouraging because you're thinking like it's so long. It's such a long shot for right. some myself to be considered in this capacity in a film like this with this with Robert De Niro. It's like, and especially when you hear all that. So it's just like, I didn't even think about it. I let it go. Uh, but you know what they say, when something's meant to be, it yeah. finds its way to be. And I was there. I was there that day. There was a guy, because this was like an Italian section of the beach. 
Jones Beach in Long Island. Yes. It's for, for us, it's like about a 40 minute ride. That's without traffic, but right. it's, it's pretty much, I would say one of the nicest beaches available to us where we are. Sure. You know, but I don't, I haven't been there in years. The ride walking from the parking lot, it's too much, but I was there that day. I was in the water. Apparently a guy was handing out flyers. My brother screams my name. I come out of the water. And my brother said, this is the guy for the uh, De Niro movie. Remember that movie we heard about? He's, uh, you know, hey, look, he gave me this. And blah, blah. so yeah. I was like, oh, wow. And he was like, oh, wow. he goes, yeah, he does look like him. So he thought I looked like him. And he asked me stuff, you know, have you ever acted? And this, that. And I said, no, no. So he said, well, why don't you come in tonight? It's a Sunday. I'll open just for you. And I'd like to put you on tape. So I went in. It was the scene when uh, <clears throat> I was shaving. But in the original script, De Niro was shaving. Okay. Couple Name was different, but it was the same thing. Hmm. He said to learn the lines. I did. We went. We read it. He loved it. And then he was like, "Wow, why don't you do another scene?" He had me doing additional stuff. And you were and able to learn lines, never having done anything. Was it hard to learn lines for the first time in your life? Memorize. I always think it's got to be tough to memorize dialogue like that, especially never, never doing it before. Well. It's not so much about the diet, you know, it's just what comes down to whether or not you have a good memory. Right. In that scene, it wasn't really a lot of dialogue. Hey, dad, let me ask you a question. You know, right, Joey, right, right. Down the block. Yeah. He asked me, you know, it's like, yeah. <clears throat> it's not like it some monologue because I would have definitely been in the other room a lot longer. But uh, right. some scenes are a lot, you know, I mean, some scenes you got two lines and then some, you know, you've got six pages of dialogue. Right, right. You know, like if you were actually shooting something like that the next day. You better be in your hotel room or wherever you're going to be learning those lines all night long so you can do, you know, like. Yeah, it's got, it seems tough. Yeah, because I recommend that. I will go back to what we were talking Sorry, about. Sorry, yeah, I keep cutting you on my. No, 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 no. It's my fault because I'm going <laughs> on a tangent. But I recommend like big monologues like that to learn really well because the fact that you have four or five pages that in itself is already intimidating. Right. I mean, okay, so you can't really wing something of that, you know what I mean, of that size. So, but I think with smaller stuff, I don't think learning the lines really, really good for smaller stuff and really, really well is the best thing just because it's simple already and it's not a lot. And I think when you learn it too much, the spontaneity in it yes. disappears. And I think you become robotic because it's like, you know, the line so well that yeah. you, and I, you know, you know who I heard didn't really, who used to do that. And I said, wow, that makes sense. I heard Marlon Brando used to do stuff like that. I've heard that and too. You know, like, and he would, and then think it like, <clears throat> but it's like, that's why it was great. Right, when you right. know, find it well, you say, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? That you take your beats and you're doing it just for doing it. But yeah. you know what I mean? It's not, is it real? And I think when you know them too, but a big monologue, you have to. You'll never get through it. Right, right. You know, something like that. But all right, back to the Bronx Tale. Yes. So the guy loved what I did. This was, the, you know, VHS era, 1992. Put me on tape. Said, we'll be in touch. You know? And uh, call me the next day. De Niro's office called me. And said that uh, they wanted me to go down. They saw my tape. They loved it. I go down there that day. There's a million kids reading for the part. Right. I did what I had to do. I got a call. They told me they want to see me the next day. Went back. There was less kids. Great job. Can you come back tomorrow? Yes, I can. Came back the next day. Less guys. So it was just like that was going on for like a yeah. few weeks to the point where it was just like me. And then, you know, you don't need to be a great actor to know. You just got to have common sense to know, like, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm the only one here. This is a good sign. So <clears throat> eventually I met, met De Niro. Um, he liked what I was doing, would make little corrections, or maybe you could do this, this. But then he was like, yeah, that's what it is. <clears throat> so then he told me one day to wear, dress like I was going to be going to church because they're going to put me on film, mm -hmm. a screen test. And all the people that he was screen testing everyone that day, all the finale, all the finalists for like every character. Right. So guys reading for the brother, you know, uh, four girls reading for the part, 
me versus the kid who shot Sonny at the end of the movie. Yes. He was supposed to be C. I thought it was me. I didn't see anybody else, so I thought I have this part. So now this guy comes and introduces himself to me. His name is Phil Garbarino, still a very good friend of mine to this day, a uh, very good guy. And he's like, hey, how are you? I'm Phil Garbarino, and I'm reading for C2. And I'm like, because now – He's not here on this day with all of these people who have chosen, been chosen to the end if he wasn't good. Right. He had to do something right to get to where he is. So now I'm worried. Who cares about the fact I look like De Niro? He's maybe a 20-time better actor. Right, right. And maybe he doesn't have to look like De Niro because he's got a mother too, right? Maybe he looks more like his mother. So then now this is the stuff that's going through my mind. So I'm like, wow, now I got my work cut out for me. I thought I was just going to come here and do what I got to do. Yeah, you got the part. But that's not what happened. So like they read, they screen tested everybody else first. So now it's me and him. So like it was like he would go in and do a scene. I would do a scene. He would go do a scene. Now the scene when Sonny slaps me around. Yeah. When I put a bomb in the car, he did it first. And they really beat him up inside that room. No, I could hear it. And no, I'm talking about really, like, really ripped his shirt, like, really, really, like, really smacked him around. So now he comes out of the room. He's all disheveled. He's, like, crying. So me and my father, like, my father looked at me like, what are you doing? What are you guys going to be up to now? So I was like, I don't know what's going on. Right? But, you know, I went in. I did it. No, they barely touched me. They're just a little push. No smacking. They were smacking him. Ripped his shirt. I'm saying to myself, why the hell did they do that to him and not me? Yeah. Okay, so whatever. We went shot for shot. That was a Thursday. Friday, I didn't have to go back. Sunday, they called me and they said that we, Bob wants to see you tomorrow. I knew that was what he was going to tell me. You're in or you're out. Right. You're in or you're out. I suddenly you know, think about that kid, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's crazy. And I just thought of this and you're going to be like, you're going to be the first one to really hear this. No, I'm not just saying that either. Breaking on the John Cat show, everybody. Yes. Okay. So I didn't realize how his own life paralleled the movie because think about this and I'm telling you right now and, and I, I'm telling you right now, I had this idea because all people would always talk about like, oh, they should do a Bronx Tale where you take over the neighborhood. Or they should do one with Pesci, which is okay if they did a prequel to show how he's sunny and this and that. Yeah. But the way that I always thought it should go, and and this is before I even saw the Joker, but the Joker was a lot about a lot looked a lot like what I had envisioned. Think about Think about why the whole movie happened. Sonny killed that guy. Yes. Right? The guy who kills him at the end is the kid, the guy's son. Mm-hmm. Remember, he was at the yeah, when I looked same. at yeah, the, yeah. the guy who killed Sonny was the son of the man he killed eight years earlier in front of my house. Right. right? So now think about this. This kid, because C had the good life and he probably had the bad life. He lost his father. Maybe his mother could have been sick. So he missed out on so many opportunities. That's exactly like the joke. And that's what I thought. I said, they should make a movie. They should make it about that kid. And just think about the ending. That's smart. But think about the ending. The Joker was awesome because he blows De Niro's face off on national television. Right, Right, right. But think about the end of this movie. The end of this movie would be when he kills Sonny. And that's the same thing. If anything, that's 20 times more brave. Right. That you're gonna to go to jail, but this is a common you're a, this is a suicide mission. You're going to a gangster, a boss's bar. Yeah. Right? You know you're not gonna make it out of there alive. But you know what? Just like how that Joker, he was a sociopath, society made him nuts. Like this kid. Society made him nuts. But then you have a psychopath, they're born crazy. But these are classic sociopaths. Yeah. Society made them nuts. This guy killed him on national television and then you have him, you have the camera off to the side and you see the bar, the, sh- the door of the bar. And then you see the kid walk into frame. Yeah, you could, you could do the whole movie. from the, huh? you, could, you could do the whole film from the other side. 
showing the whole right. right. It's happening at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. So like he's up seems Batman. He's the Joker. Right. Right. I swear, my father he died June twenty fourth, two thousand eighteen. Sorry. On my father's grave, I envisioned this all before I saw the Joker, because you got to think about it. Batman's a great story, but think about the Joker. What this guy went through. Right. Think about what this kid went through. They probably had to move to a different neighborhood because you know he was killed by a boss. So obviously he did something wrong. Yeah. You don't shoot people like that. A guy like that is not going to just shoot somebody on the street for no reason like that. So this guy, he had to have done something. So maybe, you know, maybe he had to move to a, a neighborhood where it was more like ethnic, you know, like just to, you know, and then he, you could hear the whole story of what happened, why Sonny did that to his father. Maybe he could be like, you know, a kid more like, you know, because this was in the 60s. Right. Maybe smoking weed and maybe he's smoking weed with some like Puerto Rican kid in another neighborhood in the Bronx. And then he's like, yo, man, so what, tell me what happened with your father, man. How did your father lose a G? Well, yo, they killed his ass, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you go into the whole story. And then you go back, little things with him and Sonny. And then you see why I get whacked. But the bottom of the line is, it's that kid. Maybe his mother's got cancer. He had to take care of his mother. He loved baseball, but he missed out on a lot of it because he had to take care of his mother. You know, that anger, flashbacks of his father. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right up until the end of the film. Well, the camera's there. You see the door. And then next thing you know, he walks into frame. You don't see anything but the back of his head, right? Right, the opposite view that you were watching in the movie. I love right. it, man. Just see, before he opens the door, because this yeah. is the moment of truth. You see him from the back of the thing, right? And he's there. And he's another thing. Maybe you see some with the shoulders. Maybe you see him like, maybe like, a, you know, like you do some, maybe that's him adjusting his gun. But you don't know that. You just see some shoulders. What the hell is that? Yeah. And maybe as you see him coming in the whole time, you're going to see the back of his head. It's going to be like the wrestler, like Darren Aronofsky shot the wrestler with Mickey Ward. Yeah, great movie. Handheld following him from the back. But this is how that has to be, from the back, Okay. You see the back of the head walking, and as you're coming, you're going to see a piece of everything else. And the Bronx Tale was so popular that I think as you're getting closer in, people are going to start to realize. like, yeah. Recreate that scene, yeah. Yo, yo, did you, yo, you know what this is? Yo, this is, this is the Bronx, yo, that's the dude that, in the Bronx Tale, that's the guy who killed Sonny's, yo, that movie was about him. Yeah. Because you'll see, see, like a kid will get like a young kid who looks like me, but you know what? It doesn't have to be a doppelganger because you're going to get him from far away. Right. And you say, Sonny, Sonny. And he's just going to have the hair with the leather jacket, a kid that looks like me. And then people, and then, and then it, it happens. Okay. You kill Sonny. Kill Sonny, his guys drag him. They drag him down the stairs because you got to understand there's a lot of patrons. Whatever's going to happen is not going to happen in front of all those people. You're going to be around people you trust because this is going to be a this is a homicide in the making. He just shot our boss. We're definitely going to kill this kid. And we got to be smart about it because we're definitely. I've never been more sure about anything in my life that we're going to kill this kid. Drag him downstairs. Boom, 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 coming down the stairs. And do you remember the song that was playing? Baby, that's life. That's yes. life. So now the stereos may be downstairs, the control. And there's maybe even speakers downstairs. So now you got the wise guys in suits. You got this kid beaten to a pulp. He's down there. And then, hey, Frank, put the volume up or something like that. Now they put the volume up even louder. Right. Louder. And those you hear Sinatra, baby, that's life. That's life. And you see like six wise guys standing over this kid. They wanted to put the radio loud, the thing loud. They muffle the sound. And just like literally between six guys, I'm talking about three or four clip changes and just shoot them like more than Sonny got shot in The Godfather. Yeah. In the basement. As Sinatra's saying, that's life. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. 
but six guys doing that. Yeah. And you see a bottle, a body with like a thousand squibs popping everywhere. Because you know what? That's probably how it would happen. That's the boss. That's a guy we love. Yeah. This is very fucking personal. This is very personal. This is not over some bullshit little business thing. A guy stole a few dollars. It's not really a big deal, but we're going to make an example out of him for whatever. I don't even care if it goes either way. Somebody said we're not going to do it, and we wouldn't give a shit about that either. But this is something that must, must, must. And that's the way I'm thinking for, for the purpose of making the film. Yeah. And it would go down just like that. I love it, man. Yes. That's the movie, it's bro. The, it's the, I, ant, the anti-hero version from the whole other. I love it. You sold me on it. Don't tell too much. Oh, like the Joker, bro. Yeah, it's the Joker version the of the Joker. Boss, though, of course. He's Batman. Yeah. But think about in real life. Think about how he, his character, how I got Sonny, taught me all these valuable things. Then he died because God didn't want him in my life anymore because then he could have potentially wounded me. I got what I got from him and what I was, what he was there for. He was put in my life to teach me that much. But that's the ceiling. We don't go past. Because Sonny is what he is. So let's leave that alone. C's actually a good kid. Let's not, because if it goes more, he may. He may. You know what I mean? You sit in a barbershop long enough, you can, you'll get a haircut. Yeah. You, eventually you will. But that's the way it was for him. So then you got his father, his father's mother loved him. He got all those valuable lessons from Sonny. He's a well-adjusted kid. This other kid has got one parent dead. His mother's sick. So it's like, shit, man. I got the shit end of the stick, you yeah. know? And then you think of that Rod Stewart song. Some guys got all the love. You know? <laughs> oh, you know what I mean? I love it. Yes. It's not like, you know, you know what I mean? But think about this. That's the movie, the characters. And then think about his real life. I got the part. He did it. <laughs> then you got the dad. I did it. Growing up. Yeah. I grew up with my mom. So it's like kind of the same thing, the parallels, which I just That's realized. That's a huge parallel, yeah. You know? There's a, you know, there's a silver lining, there's a meaning, there's hidden meanings everywhere. Uh, for, for Yeah, so I, you know, eventually got the part. You know, De Niro told me I got the part, and I was ecstatic, and, you know, I made that. Movie turned out to be a huge success. Did you? Well, by all the critics. Did you know um, going in, you know, you weren't only, by the way, if anyone hasn't seen A Bronx Tale, go check it out. 1993. It's an amazing movie. And uh, it, like you said, it still holds up to this day and all the parallels and lessons and everything that are in it. But you not only start, by the way, you're, you're among these legends, Robert De Niro, Charles, but, but you were the star of the movie. You were the protagonist. You also narrated the movie throughout. It's your voice narrate. Did you know going in that you were going to be narrating as well, or was that kind of worked out in production? Or no, that's the way it was. The original script, Kolodjero did the, the narration. She had a perfect voice for it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. I mean, I appreciate it. it. That, you know, you know who had the perfect voice for it? More, way more than me. Ray Liotta, Goodfellas. Yeah, and the poor Sage utilized that damn camera with his voice. He's a great actor too. But the way it was shot with the voice, like when De Niro was waiting for Henry in the diner. Yes. Remember when the murderers always come with smiling faces? Yes, yes. They come to you at the time when you need them the most. And Henry's the camera. He's the POV, the moving POV, the point of view. And his voice is going. And the next thing you know, you see De Niro. Hey, that because when he gets up. And that's when he really wants to kill him. He's got this smile. <laughs> wants to kill this guy. That was awesome. Right, that right. Was, yes. But, uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I knew from the beginning, I knew it was a big task. Thank God he gave me the strength, the ability, the the calmness, you know what I mean? Yeah. So to, be able to take it on and do as well as I did, thank God, you know? So you'd never acted, you you go right into the Bronx Tale, you're working with De Niro, Palminteri, all these people, and then you jump right in, next movie I think was Renaissance Man, right? More Legends, Danny DeVito, Gregory Hines is in that movie, and... I, by the way, I saw that movie again recently, Renaissance Man, and it's your scene again is like the crescendo of the movie. We were talking about it before, now that I think about it, you were saying monologues are art. That must have been a tough freaking Shakespeare monologue when you're doing that well, St. Yeah, Crispin's in the... Yeah, yeah, that wasn't one night. That was months. <laughs> right. Because you don't understand. That's you Shakespeare. Whole, right. You also have the Shakespeare element 
and delivering the lines and you know finding out what it means because a lot of this stuff to me was gibberish i didn't really know much shakespeare sure. who he was and what it what it was but i didn't really i'd never heard, watched any films or read any books or having to do with shakespeare so now this is his whole saint christmas day speech henry the fifth it's like wow and I, right. it's just like a page and then another page and then another page I'm like wow that was like really that had my stomach in the knot for months is it is it um register at the time that like i'm doing a scene with gregory hines and, and these legends of the game you know it's got to be a surreal yeah, experience gregory hines huh? was a good man rest in peace he was yes. a, you know, rest in peace and also penny marshall she directed she yes. was a very good woman very good uh you know very good person also i mean i was very, very relatable for me she was from the bronx from east tremont so we like spoke the same way it's like i'm set her and i had like the same accent you know right. so we to like say things and joke around to each other where no one else would understand because they weren't from where we were from. And she was, uh, you know, it was a you know, real blessing. I learned a lot from Penny Marshall. That's she awesome, was, man. Talk about legends. Yeah. You know, Danny DeVito couldn't believe how talented he was in person to work with him like face to face and before editing and before color correction and before sound and before music and before all that. When it's raw and you feel the raw acting of what that person has, his ability or her ability, unbelievable amount of raw talent. Danny DeVito, yeah. that guy is so talented. I remember working, I mean. He's unreal. Yeah, yeah. And then Denzel Washington. I was going to say, you, right after that, you got, what, Crimson Tide. You got um, Enemy of the State. Yeah, Denzel, Gene Hackman, Will Smith. You're talking about, and then. Yeah. But Denzel, Denzel's... He's my favorite, man. I love Denzel. Let me tell you something. I got to tell you, he's probably one of mine, if not my favorite. You can't... I mean, the guys... And he's from Mount Vernon. I'm from Yonkers. He's right, That's the next city. He knows where I'm from. I know where he's from. He was talking about places like Hartley Park. And Denzel Washington had a Ferrari, took me for a ride. I mean, the guy was great. I mean, in that movie. I mean, I mean it just anything he does... He brings emotion. He can go from zero to 60, not like not too many actors I've seen. Oh, yeah, any part, that guy. No, but the emotion, the way he brings it, and so fast and so hard and so real, I don't think there's many that can do that right now, the way he does it. Like in John Q, when the doctor said that his son was sick and whatever, and you way he goes, no! Yeah. He goes, I can't accept that. The way he did it, I can't do it. Right, right. Close, but the way... He does those things. Or like in training day when he got shot in the ass. You know, that whole thing in the pro in the hood, in the projects. Okay. Come on. Yeah. That, and then he'll do the, what was the Civil War one? Glory? Yes. All right, just think of glory and training day. <laughs> that's different people. That's too, like, that's too, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like Morgan Freeman. Driving Miss Daisy, and then when he played the uh, lean on me when he played the principal, Joe Clark. Remember how nuts he was in that? How hardcore? And then he was a little pushover driver. That's range. Yes. That's real range. Oh, what about Ben, ben Kingsley? You know oh, Ben yeah, Kingsley? Yeah, of course. Okay, did you ever see? Uh, I know you saw Gandhi, right? Yes, of course. Did you ever see Sexy Beast? I don't think so. Oh, watch that movie. I'm writing it down. Sexy Gandhi Beast. Was like a I'm writer. always looking Gandhi for movies. Like the, 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 Gandhi was like the male version of Mother Teresa. You know what I mean? Okay. And then in, 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 the, in, in the Sexy Beast, he plays the opposite of that. Okay. So, uh, he was like a, he's a thief. He's a criminal. Okay. There's this one guy who was with them. They need him for this job. It's in the water. They want to steal some stuff. They're like big time criminals in, 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 you know, like in London. The guy who they need, he retired. And they need him though, so they got to convince him. So Ben Kingsley's like a, he's a sadistic, crazy fucking gangster. He's insane. I'm going to check that out. He's insane. So he's got to go to Spain to get this guy and say, you're coming with us, right? The first, the first time you see him in the movie, in the film, the guy who he's going to see his wife picks him up from the airport. So he's in the car. He's like real stiff. And then right before he goes, he goes, he tells the guy's wife, he goes, he goes, get me out of this car. Starting to smell like a cunt. 
Just do it. Yo. <laughs> he doesn't say anything. That's the first thing he says. And he's so. He that that like, alone makes me want to see the movie right there. Yeah. Like just the way he does it. It's like it's like a dragon breathing yeah. fire. Every time he speaks. It's like a dragon breathing fire. But there's no screaming. There's, you know what I mean? Yes. The truth, the real tough guys never yell, you know? It's a quiet it, aggression. He does get nuts a few times where he screams. <laughs> right. It's really scary because he can do it without it. But, okay, so now we go back. So working with Denzel, Crimson Tide, you know, all of these films surface. You know, so, like, you can imagine what it is. It's, like, drugs accept, very easily accessible, out every night of the week, women, all happening at a time in my life where I lacked the experience in how to navigate through things like this. Like now I'm a master of it. You can put me anywhere. You can put me in a place where people are doing drugs or doing this. I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't intentionally put myself in situations like that, but sometimes you're out and you never know what the night's going to bring. Right. You never know who's going to show up. You never know what's coming your way. And these are the times you have to be, you know, very, aware of and very vigilant and prepared for. You have to be, you have to have a contingency plan in place. What happens if I see somebody I used to do drugs with? What happens if I see somebody I used to buy drugs from? What happens if this, what happens if the, you know what I mean? Yes. So like, uh, but. So when, when this was, when this was all happening, I got to ask about Sopranos. I'm so sorry. Yo, so bro, are you kidding me? When you, Speaking of legends and also rest in peace, James Gandolfini. It was there a better act to talk about amazing actors that could bring an emotional intensity, right? Um, you were a uh, season two, Matthew Bevilacqua. I love the humor in that. People always think what a great show. I love the humor in that show. And uh, you in particular, your characters were hilarious in that with the uh, Wobistic stuff and all the, uh, the scene with Furio where you guys are in your underwear and he's coming over to collect the money. No, that was, I mean, can you, I don't think you can get better writing than that show. Um, I was actually just watching a couple of scenes last night. I was watching a couple of scenes last night. I was going to ask, you watch yourself? Not, not ones that I was in, but ones that were, I watched, uh, I mean, that was a great experience. I knew Gandolfini. I knew Gandolfini from Crimson Tide. Remember, he was in that also. Can I, can I interrupt you real quick? Because you just sure, touched on sure. something. Settle an argument for me. And that, that is true. He was a small part in Crimson Tide. I always tell my wife she gets annoyed because whenever we watch a movie and I see people that were in something together before, I go, oh, he, he, he must have brought him in for the audition or whatever. Is that, how, is that how that works? And I was thinking that example, you've got the Gene Hackman example, two movies in a row, and your mother in Bronx Tale is Charmaine Bucco, right? Right, correct. Uh, Artie's yeah. wife. It's, is that how that works? Did they go, oh, I work with this guy in Bronx Tale and we bring him in, he'd be great for the part? Or you have to back me up on this. I don't want my wife to be right. I mean, that could be one of the reasons. I don't think there is a reason. I think there's a few reasons. Okay. Either that or because of the brand in which he created in this genre, we know he can work here and people know who he is. You know? But uh, it's a small community. People know each other. Uh. People work together. They know each other from other projects. Yeah, I mean, let's face it. When you're watching something and then you're like, oh, yeah, I love this guy. I remember him from that. Oh, you know, I, I'm so happy he's on this show. I like him from that or this. So that's how it goes. And I guess that's the reason behind that. But there's, you know, many reasons. But then, like, I didn't, like, when I read for the first season of The Sopranos, I didn't get the part. I read for Brendan Falone, Christopher Oh, Schreck, wow, yeah. So they said I was too young. They said, but they didn't even know if they were going to get picked up. They said, if we get picked up, we'll bring you back for another, you know, if something's right. So they did. They brought me back in for Bevel Aqua, and I got that part. But before all of this, when they, the first season came out, because I read, I didn't get the part. I totally forgot about this. Like, whatever, you know what I mean? Mm. Even know if it was going to come on because they alluded to the fact it could go either way. So now I'm watching TV in like November, December, and they start showing the coming attractions. I was like, oh, wow, The Sopranos, it's coming out. So then I saw Gandolfini. And like, you know, let's face it, back then he was the 
not the most obvious choice. Nobody knew who he was. I knew who he was. I'd never seen him play anything like that. I seen him play Crimson Tide. He was a sailor, a straight laced guy. So I'm like, this is the guy. Like, this is who they chose for. But you know, after seeing the first episode, I knew exactly why they chose him. And that was probably the best depiction of that on film I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, he became that character. I mean, he really yeah, no. no, 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 no. He was unbelievable. That show it, Yeah. Unbelievable. And because it was so against type, like you said, you know, a bigger overweight guy. And then what was also the balding, you know, he was balding and he was believable. Right. Like when you scream at his guys and go nuts, you believe it because you see how big he is. And he carries that weight. Well, last night I was just watching the scene. I probably still have it in my, uh, my history. Where are you? This is what I watched last night. Still in my history. Zero growth to this family's receipts. What's the fucking money? You're supposed to be honest. That's why you got the top tier positions. So each one of you go out to your people on the street, crack some fucking heads, create some fucking honors out there. The guy. We talked about this over the other place with the guy. The councilman. What the fuck happened to that? He peed it out. He peed it out. He died on the vine. He died on the vine. He died on the vine. The guy, he moved or something. Oh, nobody knows what the fuck I'm talking about. We hear you, Tom. I remember that oh, well. My Poor Ralph. You know, like, like the way he screams in his size. Yeah. The heavy breathing, you believe everything that he does, and the way those guys we hear you, the way they're scared. Yeah, I believe all that. I believe that. 100%. Did you have the writing though? I want to know why there's zero growth in this family's receipts. Where's the fucking money? And then, I mean, the writing. Yeah. Even though it's so real, it's so different. It's not cliche. None of it, but. It always remains authentic. Yeah. It never, ever did not, was not authentic. Those people, that show, not even because I was on it. You could scratch me out of it. You could put somebody else in that role, would have been just as good as me. That writing is so good on that show. That writing on that show is so good that I think any actor could shine because it's so good. But then there's, you know, and, but I'm not minimizing mm-hmm. how great everyone was. But I mean, but I'm trying to really say how great the writing yeah. was. That writing was unbelievable. Like I couldn't believe my ears sometimes hearing some of the stuff that was said and the storylines, and I was like, "Wow!" Yeah. I, <clears throat> my opinion, it's the best show ever. Funny, funny story about that show. I guess this would have been like 20 years ago. You guys were doing a premiere party for that. My sister, since you showed me something on your phone, I'm gonna. She wanted me to show you this. I apologize. She met you. At a Sopranos premiere party. Can you see that? No, you got to raise it up. I can't see uh, your screen. But that's you and my sister there. Oh, wow. I'll put it Wow, that's it. Yo, man, you got to send me that picture. I'll send it to you. I know when that was, too. She she snuck into that party. She was supposed to be working as a hostess. I know the exact date to that party. Tell me, tell me. It was on that September 9th, 2002. Okay. That the, the the and that scene that I just showed you, it was in the episode that premiered at Radio City Music Hall. Oh wow! That was the time I seen that, so picture that authority and that big Hulk and that acting ability on that big screen, yeah. talking to his captains like that. It gave me chills. That's awesome. Because I mean, like wow, I couldn't believe like the greatness and to hear it in yeah. the surround. To hear Gandolfini. You have no idea. Like, I love, I have such a passion for acting and filmmaking. I love it. And when you watch guys like that, the way they do it, and to have seen that on that big screen, to work with them, it's like De Niro, Denzel, all these people. It's not just, you know what I mean? All these actors that I've worked with. It's like, 
you learn so much. You grew up, you grew up watching them and seeing them, and now you're part of it. But that night, and then and then the party was at the uh, Rockefeller Center. It was gorgeous out that night. All right. Shoot. And I remember my hair came out good too. And then that picture, I could see it. I'll send oh, it I- to you after the show. She really was. She was supposed to be. She was like an early twenty. She was supposed to be uh, like hostessing or waitressing or something. And she brought a change okay. of clothes and like went in the bathroom and put on like a cocktail dress and then went out and attended the party like she was supposed to be there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I saw John Ventimiglia. Artie Bucco's in the picture. Yeah, he, I was just gonna say he's in there smoking a cigarette. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was talking to his parents that night. His parents are Sicilian. I speak that dialect very well. Oh wow. I- Speaking to his mother, his mother was saying, Precheezy, precious. She grabbed my face, precious, because I speak it so well. His parents are really nice people. You know what that means? Ventimiglia, Ventimiglia, uh, 20 miles. Okay. Vente, 20 miglia. Okay. Vente, 20 I got miles. you. Oh, okay. You know? John Ventimiglia. So. Oh, I get it. I get it. Right. So 20 miles, that's what his name Interesting. is. Interesting. I, know, I guess I know, you know like Christopher Moltisanti, Christopher Many Saints, Moltisanti, Many Saints. Interesting. The Godfather, Frankie Pentangeli, and his nickname was uh, Frankie Five Angels. Pentangeli, Pentagram, Five Sides, Angeli, Five Angels. That's interesting. I never put that together before. The Italian yeah, like that. with yeah, the meaning that is very stuff. cool. Yeah. yeah, I'm into that. So, but uh, but so yeah, we spoke about all the up. You know what I mean? And with all that and that lifestyle and everything that it brings, it brought a lot of temp- temptation, a lot of bad temptation. I started dabbling in the drugs, which I had so much free time. I had money, I had accessibility. So that was a perfect, you know, that was a perfect storm. Uh, and, you know, as time went on, it just got worse and worse and worse. Got addicted to cocaine. Then as a result of the cocaine and the psychosis, I jumped out of a car. I thought that my friends were going to kill me. Then I started with the pain pills. And then with that, the heroin, the crack. And then on the fateful night of December 10th, 2005, I was my ex-girlfriend's father because I loved her. She didn't want to be with me anymore. My, I was a crack crack addict and a heroin addict. She was going to college and she didn't want to be with me. She woke up with me, heartbroken. So I started hanging out with her father as a reason to see her go by the house. Didn't know the extent of what this guy was. I mean, I knew he wasn't, you know, uh, Gandhi, but I didn't think, you know, he was what he was. Right. I mean, I knew he liked to drink. I knew he liked to do drugs, but guess what? So did I. So that's fine. I don't right. care. I got a guy that, you know, an older guy that I could pal around with and do drinks and drugs and see my, the girl that I love here and there. Okay. This is cool. That's basically what it was. But then in the news, they make it out. Oh, cop killer. I wish people knew this was all because I loved the girl, you know? So just, <laughs> by the love now they're showing you knew about this and you knew about so, that dude the only thing i was thinking about was his daughter and how much i loved her what can i do to get her back so for for people that that don't know the story um and correct me if okay. I'm much, but you were with your you were with your girlfriend's father you went over to the house of an old friend it was kenny i think Man, we couldn't get any more drugs he was a heroin addict as well we were both getting dope sick the kid who sh- uh the little kid who played me in the bronx still younger his Sister was my first love. Francis. Capra. Good guy. Good actor. Yes. So now next door from where they, I used to go see them was this guy, Kenny Scavodi, who was my friend, older gentleman. He was like 47, 48 and like 93. He was a Vietnam veteran and, you know, um, used to give me Valium. Oil. He was a little loopy from the war. He wasn't all there. He would give me pills. So this is what I did. This is, so now many years, I, we went to a drug dealer's house not far. He didn't have anything. So now the desperation, I go to this guy's house, I'm, you know, banging his window. Eventually I break it to try to go in. Right. You know what I mean? Um, but I never went in because I didn't have intentions to go in. I was just trying to get his attention. The guy didn't come. I was leaving, walking away. A male voice said, don't move. I turn around. I get shot. The guy I'm with was going to the bathroom against the wall as I was walking away. Then he started getting shot. He had a gun, which I didn't know about because we weren't, this wasn't something that was planned. We were going to a sure. strip club, get high. Just wanted to get heroin because I was sick. Just wanted to get more heroin and go home. When you're a heroin addict, you don't want to start complicating your night and committing homicides. And that's not what people you just, do. You just want your fix. That's you know. Go home. Right. You know, like this is the last thing that I want. Right. You know, so it's like 
So, so this this guy next door, he's an off duty cop. He comes out to off break duty the window, NYPD, and he shoots you two, three times in the abdomen and the side. You you're Correct. you're hobbling off. Your girlfriend's dad exchanges fire, ends up killing him. You wake right, up the but next. My, my, yeah, but he got shot. For, he got shot first, and he got shot. You know, like six to nine times. And and you didn't. And that was the key to this case too. You know, they. Uh, you know, again, for people that don't know. Um, and 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 what I want to talk about too. You know, you got sober when you were in prison and stuff like that. But you went to the law library and really researched your case and and found out. And you were technically only convicted of attempted burglary because, like you said, you didn't break, you didn't go in, you just broke the window, and there was no murder charge because you didn't know this guy had a gun. But right. they they still no. The charge was there. The murder charge. The charge was there. Was there excuse me, but they they couldn't convict yeah. you on that because there's no right knowledge. because the whole case was contingent on. The knowledge, the fact, whether or not I had knowledge of the gun. And, you know, that's only by a preponderance of the evidence, that element of the crime. And they still failed to prove it. At the end of the day, all you did was break a window. Right. And got that's shot. That's all I did. Right. You know, that's all I did. And listen, I was guilty of, you know, destroying private property. I was guilty of making bad choices, doing drugs, hanging out with a bad guy, uh, you know. Was I guilty of the police officer's death? Listen, I take full responsibility for how my actions, my drug addiction contributed to the death. Because then we go back to the decision making. The decision making was to decide to hang out with this guy who did that. So, yes, I am somewhat responsible for the contribution. Sure. If I was there alone that night, breaking the window, Doing everything I was doing with everything was in my pocket. Same thing without the other guy, the cop would still be alive. So that's not a felony murder. If you can take the other guy out of the equation and your actions in the felony that you're alleging that I'm committing your actions. Okay. Cause the death of a non-participant. It's felony murder. You go rob an old lady's purse. She gets scared and she has a heart attack. Felony murder. You 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 could have shot her in the head. It's right. the same. It's the same thing. That's the way the law is written. But now it's like, ugh, but even if Lilo did this without Steve, the same exact thing, the guy would still be alive. It's not a felony murder. But, uh, I, deserve, I did not deserve to go away for the rest of my life for that. Uh -huh. Okay, the man lost his life, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about that. Think about it every day. How I wish I could go back. He was a great kid. He was 28, loved his parents, took him doctor's appointments. He was a good man. He took two jobs. No reason why he should have died. I think about that, believe me. But at the same time, as far as me killing him, that's not the way it happened. There's no way. There's no way that that's the way it happened. No, it doesn't sound like it. And and also... I got, I got shot first. I got shot right. first. And you weren't armed. Me, with this guy's murder, when you shot me first and I don't have a gun, right. how happen where does this come from how can you charge me with murdering you you shot me right first and it wasn't like you were um you know some thug or something you like you said you were you were looking to get your fix you weren't uh out there gang banging or something you didn't even have absolutely a weapon on right you. bro prior to that night and i was 29 years of age that night prior to that night do you know how many times i got in trouble zero i got in trouble in my life other than possession of drugs or under the influence right Never. 29 years old. Never. I have a... You know how many felonies out on my record? Zero. Do you know how many times I hung out with people with guns other than my father or my brother because they're hunters? But that's a whole different thing. Yeah. Talking about concealed weapons, illegal concealed weapons you go kill people with or shoot people. Or well, now you have these big rifles that you go, you know, it's a sport. Some people don't see it like that. Either way, you know, I'm not... I'm, it's a weird thing, the penal system. I've always thought that, especially when it comes to drugs and things like that. I mean, the, the idea that we would take people because they're using a substance and then stick them in a box, in a cage, is you, what are you actually accomplishing? Unless you're planning on trying to rehabilitate the person and, you know, it's cheaper to put them into some sort of treatment than to stick them in a cage. And um, You're right. I think initially that's what they try to do a lot of the times. Right. But you know what? Yes and no. Because you know what? They stuck me in a cage and it, well, it me. I was going to say, what you did, you got your GED, you got your college degree. Talk about that a little. Right. How'd you get sober right. so in you prison know what? And, and get your Maybe, you know, 
the way it's designed can work if you work it the right way. If you recognize what it's for and you go there, you know, like, well, listen, some people may not be as fortunate as I am, and that doesn't mean that they're less than me, but some people may not have the financial means to go to school while they're there because the GED, they offer the state, but the college, it was a, a real, you know, uh, degree. It wasn't a certificate. It was a real school in Georgia, Ashworth College. So it's like, was real material that I real I earned a real degree, an associate's degree. That's amazing. That should be paramount. I mean, if we're if we're putting people away and we're saying, "Hey, you're you're a detriment to society," or whatever like that, we should one hundred percent be giving them as many opportunities as they can to, to achieve. Right, because if you things. educate yourself and you become smarter, your decision making will also get better. There's definitely there's yeah. one can't happen without the other. You you know what I mean? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, yes, yeah, so that's the way it goes. You know. If you're educated, you're more educated. I think it can help with your, never underestimate the power. There's so much that an education can can do for you. And it's changed me in such profound ways to where my whole train of thought, my way of thinking is much different now. So, and then, that, and that's what I was going to say. It's amazing. You, you got out uh, 2013, I guess you did what? Eight years out of the 10, you had the time off, your, your good time taken off because you didn't do anything bad. And then you had the extra time because you went to school. Six months I had. Yes, yes. I had Six two months. and a half years taken off. So basically, no, I had a year and a half taken off. And then I had this, so I had basically two years off. Two years off because you went to school, you were doing the right things. And since you've been out, that's really been your main, that's the thing. The main message since you've been out, the positivity, the helping the other people, the motivation. I mean, you're just such a perfect example. Like you said, you work the system, people that, you know, you can come for, you could be in the worst situation possible, right? You can be... Uh, you know, a uh, drug addicted, uh, locked in print, and you can still go, Hey, I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to get my college degree. I'm going to do all these things. It's like, um, you know, you're talking about like Hollywood and acting and stuff like that. I think you would, you would think Hollywood, you know, as tolerant and progressive as they always say they are, you would think they would have a little bit different perspective on some of that stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, as far I think, as I think, they'll, I think they'll start to come around now. I think a lot of time has passed. I've proven that I can stay on the straight and narrow, and I've proven that my decision making is much better than it was, and I'm much less of a liability, you know, than I would have been. I mean, to to me, it's even that. Be, beyond that. It's like you're a shining example of you know pointing to someone that did do the wrong things, perhaps earlier in life and now look what they're doing with their life so it's like it's almost like you should be going out of your way in my in my humble opinion to put people like that you know on a, on display and say hey look if, if this guy did this what he went through you guys can go through anything and come out on top as well the perseverance right yeah no you know that's what it's all about that's why god you know does things for people like that when he helps you through things it's like he wants you to use that experience because guess what? You're not going to be the only person that's going to go through something like that. So now that you went through it and I saw you through it, I want you to use that to help the next guy. Exactly. So go through this too now. Hey, listen, man, I went through this. This is what you should do right now. That's the way it works. Or what can I do to help you, man? I know what you're going through. You yeah. know, it's simple as that. And you do that with people, right? You 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 meet people online. You help them with their own situations all the time, all the time. That's and it's, you know, it's so it feels so good for me to be able to like wow, like God gave me this this ability to help other people, and how much they take heed to it, and how much they listen, and how much it's like wow, you know. But thank God, you know, all these uh, good decisions, and you know, the time being sober, which is everything. That's my whole life hinges on that, my sobriety. <laughs> You know, as a result of that, I have made some movies. Uh, one that I produced, my partner, Victor Rios, it's called The Fury. It's awesome vigilante film, high powered. It's, it's an action film. It's got an awesome story. It's shot so well. It costs us under half a million dollars. It's called The Fury. Wait, wait till you see yeah, Wait till you see this film. I can't wait. That's awesome, man. You're, you're going to be very surprised. And I'm also in that play, member of law enforcement. That's awesome. Uh, I have another film called Made in Mexico where I play a cartel guy. Oh, very the cool. The accent, the beard, the cowboy hats, and, you know, uh, that Mario Lopez produced. 
uh, my friend uh, Rodney Rinks, who's Mario's hair and makeup guy. He wrote it. This guy's a good friend of mine. So I did it. It's a different role for me, different character. You know, I have a film that's on demand right now called The Fifth Burrow. My friend Steve Stanulis, he directed it. Tara Reed's in it. Oh, awesome. Uh, I'm yeah, telling you, man, it, it, and I don't know anything, but if I was making a movie, you'd be the first guy I'd think of. Just like I said, not not just the talent, but just the example you, that you set. Like, thank you, bro. And one thing, but one thing, one other one, I don't want to leave out. Oh, please, please. Sopranos, and I wanted to, you know, bring this. Jamie Lynn Sigler, Meadow Soprano, she plays my wife in this awesome uh, short film. It takes place in the '80s. I got the mustache. I play a guy Sal. She's my wife, pregnant, but she's like. You know, like she's like, it's being, my father abused my mom. It was like very oppressive, you know, right. oppressive. I'm like that with my wife. We got kids. One kid, I'm not happy the way he turned out. So I'm like abusive. It's like a really awesome character. Michael Spitzia, David Stern, the writers, Michael directed it. And it was like shot with all like top notch stuff. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, it's called I Am On Fire. I Am On you Fire. Know, That's awesome. A little reunion. Bruce Springsteen. Do you know the song? Ooh. Of course. Oh, one of my favorites. Yes. That song is the song. In, that's the theme song. Bruce Springsteen gave us that song for free. Wow. He was abused as a kid. So he can identify with the material and the story and what the kid's going through in the film. So he said, here, I want you to have this song. And that's a beautiful thing. So, uh, awesome. You know, and I'm always thinking, always working. I work, uh, you know, I also work as a director of public relations for a company called More Life Recovery. My good friends, uh, Steve Barone, Joe Coyle. It's based in Metuchen, New Jersey. Um, I if, basically, would, you know, it's an awesome company. It's an IOP. Intensive if, if, if people want to find you on, on that, if people do want to get involved in helping on, with recovery, say the name of the organization one more time and how they can find you. And it's we'll called More Life Recovery. Perfect. More life recovery. It's uh, we have an Instagram page as well, um, and I do these like cool little like minute, two minute movies having to do with addiction. Tomorrow, my first one will be done. I do a group a week. I I post inspiring uh, stories on my Instagram, so it's a really cool job. It's really you know it's really it's because it's not really a job. I love doing this. Yeah. Then you see the looks on these kids' faces in the groups, and you make a difference. And then you talk to them in the park a lot, and they're like good kids. They're just like, you know, right now in the grips of addiction. Doesn't mean I can't get out of it, but they got to do the right things. It's going to take a little little strength. It's, ama right it's amazing that you do that. I, I also... No, no, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I'm saying it's going to take a little strength from right here to cross that threshold to where you are no longer in the grips. When you're in the grips, it's not a, de it's, it's not a decision whether, you know, maybe I should or I should. No, when you're in the grips, there's no decision. You have to use. Right, right. Your body's craving it physically. So you have to. There's no, oh, yeah, well, I just say no. You can't. That, that doesn't apply. But you go through your detox, properly medicated. It's not going to be easy, but it may be easier with the detox. It definitely will. But then eventually and ultimately it's going to be up to you. Now you know what to do. Are you going to do what you know? It's a question. You know what to do. Are you going to do what you know? You've been here 90 days. You acquired the tools, you're clean and sober, so right now it is a choice. Right. Your body's rid all those toxins, all that drug, everything out. <clears throat> now it's the mental part. Right. So this is what, but you know, and this is when people, places, and things, and all that stuff comes into play. Because if you're going to be swimming with sharks, eventually you're going to get bit. Right? You got to stay away from that. Everyone has two dragons inside them, a good one and a bad one, you know? Feed the good one. <laughs> Feed the good one, you know? Right. That's the bottom line. Go to church, do the right things. Feel good about yourself because of the good things you're doing for other people. And that'll keep you on the right path. But you got to, it's like, you know, all of these things are going to determine where you're going to end up. You got to have discipline. You got to be very wise. I, you gotta learn from your mistakes and stay with the right people who are doing the right things in the right places. Because now you're staying busy with things that don't associate with what was your demise at one time. But now you're hanging out at this guy's house. You know you used to do this with him. Right. This other guy stops by once in a while, and you guys used to smoke crack. 
And it's like and once in a while, not every night, you go to the bar with them, you drink club soda. Bad, bro. That's bad news. You're going to relapse. You're going to relapse. I, I, you don't I, be there. I see your uh, Instagram. They love you or whatever. But you can help them. But after, you know, he's got to help himself. And when you have yourself to worry about, it's hard to put your, uh, you know, it's hard to, to, it's not hard. You can't right. stretch yourself to put yourself in those situations. Don't even be in the, I see your Instagram and you're always doing positive, healthy stuff. You're always working out. You some shirtless vids. He's, uh, Lilo is, what do they say? Jacked or yoked nowadays? What do they say? Swole? Yes, look not at that. Bad, not bad, not bad. What do they say? I think I'm they in say, good shape. It shows I don't shape. work I like out. I don't know out. the word. But yes, huh? how does if you could talk about like how that correlates to what you're talking about? How what is the working out? Uh, you know, well, the working out, the working out, uh, you know, cause your brain to release endorphins, and that's a natural high. And I crave that every day. And eating but healthy. It's a great high when I'm running in the street at 98 degrees, and I'm sweating, running up hills top speed and then I'll slow down when the hill's done like that's serious trust me but it, it's hard when you're doing it but when you're done those endorphins will keep you flying all day and also you release all that stress so now when you release all that stress the impulse like the impulsive behavior and the tendencies they don't diminish they could still be there but they're a lot less and you're able to control yourself you're less stressed. You make better decisions. And then it's one day at a time. Then tomorrow's another day. You, when that comes, you've got to do the same thing. And then do the same thing, you know? Can so I, like battle. It's consistent. You got to be consistent. You can't do it for a you know, whole week. Can I read a quote? Oh, you, you post quotes on Instagram. I'm not going to keep too much longer. You've been insanely gracious with your time. But uh, can I read a quote you put on Instagram recently? A couple of them. Sure. Speaking sure. to this. You said reality check. There are people out there doing more with less while you complain about not having enough. Like going through what you've been through. And like you said, that, that work you're putting in, it's got to be frustrating sometimes. People complaining about silly mundane things, right? And they, they have no idea. Yeah, yeah. Even myself, though, if I complain, like I have so much more than so many that are less fortunate. Yeah. The main thing, I have my health. That's number one. You know what I mean? 100%. I have my health in prison than not having my health outside. I'd rather be healthy in there than not healthy out here. That's a great point. That actually I mean, you get up in the morning, you gotta wake up every day and you're sick. You can't walk, right. this hurts. Nah, bro, leave me in there, I work out every day, I got my visits, and I'll just set my mind that this is what it's gonna be forever. That's you know? speaking of exactly, you. the next quote I was gonna read, it's a short one, you said, staying positive doesn't mean you have to be happy all the time. It means that even on hard days, you know that there are better ones coming. That's just right. the perfect outlook. You know, you could, you could That's be in any truth, brother, you know, because when you think about like how doomed you are on a day where, you know, you're having a bad one, you think you're the only person you think, just think about, you know, like misery loves company. So, you know what? Think about the company you have in this situation. You got guys right now or girls or females that are going through the worst shit in their life. They just got diagnosed with pancreatic case cancer in the stage four. Mm -hmm. And you're worried about this shit? Do you know what this person's going through? Yeah. And it's like, you start thinking about that. And it's like, man, what I'm going through right now is nothing. I sleep it off tonight by tomorrow, even afternoon, even if it's still there, because I've sat on this. And eventually it's like, it's like putting your hand, picking out a pizza out of an oven. It's going to burn at first, mm -hmm. but then the, the, the skin gets thicker and more caught. You'll be pulling them out like nothing. It's not a big deal. You know, so that's what it's really about. Better days always come, bro. That's it. Up, down, up, down. That's life. And I remember my priest said that to me. He came to visit me. And, uh, he said, Lilo, there are good and bad days in here and out there. It's not only in here. He said, in there and out there. And I said, yeah, you're right, Father John. I said, you're right, because, you know, my father's sick, and I know what he's going through, and he can barely, you know. So that's what it is, man. Make the best. What did that mean? Breathing, you have a lot. They you have a lot more than a lot of people don't. That don't. That, that, they don't. I, I, I lost my dad last year, too. I've talked about it last oh, October. My, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. My condolences. Thank you. And and that was like, you know, he had been sick a long time, too. That was like the main thing I took from that whole experience was, like you said, health and just that life so short. You know, that's really why I started this podcast, too. I was like, it really kind of makes you reevaluate things. Go, you know, am I doing something I'm passionate about? 
life really is it can be over like that so you you know like you said just stay positive and one day at a time and do things that you care about and you're passionate about right yep stay busy with the things that you love because you're going to accomplish more than one thing you're doing what you love that's the first thing and you're staying busy and when you're staying busy you don't have time to do anything bad because you're busy doing things that you love that's it it's that's that awesome. simple it's a very simple explanation. If you can apply that and do that, you'll be okay. And you'll have a good life because you love what you're doing. I love so. it. I'll, I'll say it again. If anyone's deserving of, you know, uh, second chances or whatever you want to call it, I mean, you know, if you're an addict or, or, or addicted to something or you make mistakes in your life, I mean, look with the choices you can still make. Look what uh, Lilo decided to do with his life after how to motivate people, inspire people. I mean, like I said, it's the best example. The example people set is so much more important than, you know, even their actions is what they decide to do after. Right. 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 Because you can really, you can really help God do his work. It's situations like that, which will later on enable the help, you to help God do his work. Because God gives his toughest battles to his toughest soldiers. You understand? So he knows. He said, I'll give it to this guy because I know he's tough inside. He's going to handle it. He's going to come back and he's going to be a well trained soldier. He's going to be a soldier of mine and he's going to help me do what I do. And that's help other people and love other people from his experience. He can't help everybody because not everybody can relate to what he went through. But the ones that can relate to him, they will relate to him. Believe me. He was in that iconic classic film, The Bronx Tale, that everybody loves. And then he showed that he's a human like everybody else. And then he showed the importance of getting up no matter how hard you got knocked down. And that it's never, ever over. And in fact, I think because of the experience, you become better after because of the fire that burns inside. Because knowing it was this, this, you could have, this close, you would have been done. I could have died so many times out here. So it's like no more of that. No more putting myself in those situations. And I'll, I'll end on that note. All right, brother? That's beautiful, inspirational, motivational. Where can people find you? Uh, I, on Instagram, uh, Lilo, L-I-L-L-O, underscore, Brancato, B-R-A-N-C-A-T-O. Check him out on there, guys. He's he's posts a lot of inspirational uh, videos. And, uh, and um, you know, like I said, he can't do anything better than try to inspire other people and help other people. And speaking of, I'm truly humbled by you even coming on today, man. I just really, really appreciate it. My pleasure, it. brother. You're, You're a welcome. good man, John. You're a good man. It. You're welcome back anytime. I will let you go. You've been super gracious and thank you so, so much. And I'll be back guys in a couple days. Uh, another you episode. It, my man. Thank Have you. Have a good one, bro.